Judy Woodruff on the News Hour tonight, a conviction. Former President Trump's company is found guilty of tax fraud. Then Georgia votes. The runoff election for a U.S. Senate seat comes to an end after a contentious campaign. And fighting fentanyl, deaths from the synthetic opioid rise dramatically among young people, prompting schools to stockpile medication to reverse overdoses. Everything that we've seen pill-wise, 98, 99% of them, are not what they look like. They are fentanyl. If you're getting it off the street, you do not know what you're getting. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by for 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, and friends of the News Hour, including Kathy and Paul Anderson, and Camilla and George Smith. The rules of business are being reinvented with a more flexible workforce by embracing innovation, by looking not only at current opportunities, but ahead to future ones. People who know, know BDO. The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, fostering informed and engaged communities. More at kf.org. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. A New York jury has found the Trump Organization guilty of 17 counts of criminal tax fraud for a scheme top executives used to dodge personal income taxes. As John Yang reports, the verdict comes as a separate investigation into the former president's illegitimate attempts to remain in power appears to be entering a new phase. Judy, officials in Wisconsin and Arizona say they've received subpoenas from the Justice Department seeking potential communications they may have had with Trump, his campaign, and his aides as they tried to reverse the results of the 2020 election. The subpoenas that are part of the investigation headed by Special Counsel Jack Smith were first reported by the Washington Post, which said Michigan officials were also subpoenaed. And in another development today, the chairman of the House committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol said the panel will make criminal referrals to the Justice Department based on its findings. Investigative journalist and author Andrea Bernstein is part of the ProPublica team covering democracy. She's also been covering the Trump Organization trial for NPR. Andrea, today's uh, guilty verdict in that trial, what was it exactly that the uh, Trump uh, Organization was accused of doing? The, the two corporate entities, two Trump corporate entities, were charged with and tried for scheme to defraud, conspiracy, and falsifying business records for essentially engaging in a long-running scheme whereby top executives would be compensated with things like luxury apartments, Mercedes Benzes, electronics, furniture, private school tuition, all of which they did not declare on their personal taxes and which allowed them and the company to save money. And what the jury found is that the Trump Corporation and the Trump Payroll Corporation were criminally liable, putting us in this novel situation where someone who was president, who wants to be president again, has his company convicted of crimes. Is, the, is former President Trump involved at all? Is he affected at all by this personally? So he is not personally charged. Of course, his company is his eponymous company. It could suffer some kinds of business consequences. But I think it's more a sort of 
uh, uh, sort of atmospheric or psychic consequence for the former president, that here is somebody who has claimed he's done nothing wrong, who still claims he has done nothing wrong, whose company was... Uh, found guilty by a Manhattan jury of 17 counts of cheating the government that he headed, including while he was the head of it. Atmospheric or, or, or sort of uh, consequences. But it also comes on a day when we learned about some concrete actions uh, by the Justice Department. What's the significance of these subpoenas from the special counsel? Right. So here we are in a situation where the Justice Department seems to be aggressively looking into criminality involving Trump's attempts to uh, avoid the peaceful transfer of power and where the January I think what the sort of overall picture is today is here is a former president whose company has been convicted of a crime who is facing more charges potentially personally from the Justice Department of the government that he once headed. That is an extraordinary and unprecedented situation in America. In history. And the chairman of the uh, January 6th committee said they haven't quite decided on the details of what the referrals will be, but w what's the range of possibilities? What might they be uh, referring to the Justice Department? Well, they referred several times during their hearings to a finding by a federal court judge that the president was more likely than not, the president at the time, Trump, to have uh, violated uh, various statutes uh, in regards to his attempt to hold on to power when it was clear that he had no further recourse. And they've said that over and over again. Chairman Betty Thompson has said it. Vice chairperson of the committee, Liz Cheney, has said it. So clearly that is at the top of the mind, but we won't know until we see their report, which will be coming out sometime later this month, and until they made a final decision on whether to refer it. Now, of course, the Justice Department has its own investigation and can look at their materials. So it may not have a big effect, but again, it's sort of a sense of a accumulation of these charges of fraud all around that Trump is now facing. Andrea Bernstein, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Stephanie Tsai with NewsHour West. We'll return to the full program after the latest headlines. The last U.S. Senate contest of the 2022 midterm elections is finally coming to an end. Today's runoff in Georgia pits incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock against Republican challenger Herschel Walker. The outcome will decide if Democrats control a tied 50-50 Senate or have a 51-seat majority. We'll examine all of this after the news summary. Congress paused today to honor the police who defended the U.S. Capitol against the January 6th attack. Lisa Desjardins has that story. In the rotunda where Capitol Police battled a violent mob, today, echoing recognition. January 6th was a day of horror and heartbreak, yet it's also a moment of extraordinary heroism. I cannot thank our officers enough for their courage, for their resolve. The Capitol Police fought to defend not just this institution, but our system of self-government. A rare ceremony for those usually in the background, as officers today received Congress's highest award, the Congressional Gold Medal. For those who courageously defended this cathedral of freedom. For many listening, the high honor mixed with deep memory of being outnumbered by thousands on January 6th with wave upon wave of violence for hours. Metropolitan Police Chief Robert Conti. The air still thick with bear spray and other chemicals, making it difficult for our officers to see and breathe. Sergeant Aquilina Gunnell, now close to retirement. Unless you were here that day, you will now understand what we went through. And uh, that acknowledgement means a lot because uh, this, for some of the officers, this is the first time they hear that. Afterward, Republican Senate Leader Mitch McConnell reached out, but the family of Officer Brian Sicknick, who died of stroke after the attack, pointedly did not shake hands with him or House Republican Leader Kevin McCarthy. For the Capitol, solemn recognition of both the sacrifices of January 6th 
and its presence in many lives still today. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Lisa Desjardins. The suspect in last month's nightclub shootings in Colorado Springs was charged today with murder and hate crimes. The attack on LGBTQ patrons left five dead and 17 wounded. Today, Anderson Aldrich appeared in court to face 305 criminal counts. The district attorney said including hate crimes charges was important. We're not going to tolerate actions against community members based on their sexual um, identity. Uh, those types of things. Members of that community have been harassed, intimidated, and abused for too long. And that's not going to occur in the 4th Judicial District. The state murder charges carry the toughest penalties, likely life in prison. The U.S. Secret Service reports Chinese hackers have stolen, stolen at least $20 million in U.S. COVID relief funds since 2020. The agency says the hackers belong to a group with ties to the Chinese government. They allegedly stole pandemic funds from unemployment and small business loan funds in more than a dozen states. The Parliament of Indonesia unanimously approved a sweeping revision of its criminal code today, banning sex outside marriage and insults to the president, among other things. In Jakarta, opponents of the new code gathered outside parliament to protest changes that they called draconian and overly broad. The government should focus on fulfilling people's civil rights, the economy and culture, such as job vacancies and health care. Instead, they passed a law that isn't democratic and controls our private lives. It's a setback for our country. The laws will take about three years to fully roll out. A United Nations report has concluded that workplace abuse is pervasive, especially among young people, migrants and women. It's the first attempt to gauge the extent of on-the-job violence and harassment around the world. Nearly 75,000 workers were surveyed. More than 20 percent reported facing abuse at work. An oversight board says Facebook's content moderation system needs a major overhaul. The company appointed board today criticized exemptions given to high profile users. It said the result has been unequal treatment and lengthy delays in taking down improper content. Still to come on the news hour, a Ukrainian Nobel Peace Prize winner works to hold Russian forces accountable for invading her country. A newly elected Republican reflects on the GOP's performance in the midterms. The largest ever strike by higher education workers disrupts classes at the University of California, plus much more. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. Today marks the end of a tight and bitter runoff race between Democratic U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker in Georgia. These days, these days, one of the most closely watched swing states in the country. And to clarify, the outcome of the race will decide if Democrats control a tied 50-50 Senate or have a 51-seat majority. And I misspoke earlier and said Republicans. Laura Barone Lopez joins me now to discuss what to watch as the polls close in the next hour. And Laura, I do want to emphasize this is about what happens with the Democrats. They're going to have the majority That's regardless. Right. So you were in Georgia just last week. You spent several days there. You watched the campaigns, both candidates in these closing days. Tell us about their final messages. So one of the biggest things that's loomed over this race, the general and the runoff, is Herschel Walker's uh, scandals and competency and character. And both of the candidates, Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock, were asked about character and competency today in their stops in Georgia. Georgia voter voting. Right now, I put my character against Raphael when I end day because right now, Georgia is looking for a senator that's going to speak for them. Raphael when I has not spoken for Georgia. Everyone knows that. Georgia is better than Herschel Walker. Amen. That's it. I'm not talking about his humanity. I'm talking about his fitness to serve. Georgia is better than that. Warnock has repeatedly questioned Walker's fitness to serve due to a lot of these scandals, whether it's the allegations of domestic abuse as well as uh, the allegations that Walker uh, paid for abortions for ex-partners. But separately on the stump, their speeches are very different. Walker has been much more focused on cultural issues. He's talked a lot about anti-trans. 
his message has been very anti-transgender athletes. And he, he asks on the stump speech regularly, what are pronouns? I don't know what pronouns are clearly referring to gender identity and um, uh, Democrats uh, saying that that correct pronouns should be used for people that uh, want to use them in gender identity. By contrast, Warnock has really focused on health care. He's focused on saying that he thinks that Georgia should expand Medicaid. And he's also uh, talked a lot about uh, access to abortion, again, making that a very big issue in the final days. And Laura, you were telling us that during these final days, both of these candidates have relied on high-profile figures to be out on the trail campaigning with them. What kind of an effect has that had? So the difference between the general election and now the runoff for Walker is that this time around, he had the support of Republican Governor Brian Kemp. Kemp did not give him a full-throated endorsement in the general election. This time around, trying to help Walker get those 200,000 voters that voted for Kemp, but not for Walker in the general election, as well as some 81,000 libertarians uh, that voted for a libertarian candidate in the general election. Now, uh, Warnock had former President Barack Obama come out in the final days, really trying to boost Democratic turnout as much as possible, again, among key groups like black voters, young voters, voters, Asian Americans, to try to tell them that, look, I know Warnock has said, I've asked you, this would be the fourth time to vote for me in about two years, but I'm going to ask you to do it again. Notably, President Trump did not go physically to Georgia this time around the way he did in the general election. He held a teller rally for Walker last night. And also, President Joe Biden did not go to Georgia. He has long said he would do whatever was necessary to help Warnock, even if that meant staying away. Something else to ask you about, and that is we know that the length of this runoff election is, what, 28 days? That's, what, less than half of what we saw in the last election, big runoff uh, in Georgia a couple of years ago. What effect is that shortened time frame had? So it has had an effect because ultimately, um, one, the runoff was a lot shorter this time around, about cut in half, which meant that last time in the 2021 runoff, candidates were able to register register more new voters. This time around, they weren't able to register any new voters for the runoff. Uh, they had only one week of early voting instead of three weeks. And also, it reduced, reduced the number of drop boxes. Now, the Secretary of State's office today was saying that uh, they feel as though that law did not restrict um, voters' ability to cast their ballot in any way. And they argue that the long lines, which we have seen in the early vote, not as much today, ultimately made it so uh, that the long lines were a reflection of the fact that it wasn't voter suppression. Another big thing coming out of the Secretary of State's office today was them saying that they are trying to tell counties, don't don't send us all of your vote totals at the end of the night all at once. When you've counted votes, send them in, because they're trying to dispel any conspiracy theories about the election being rigged. Well, big stakes in this election, even though we know Democrats will control of the Senate either way, that one vote can make a big difference. Laura Barone Lopez. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you can find up-to-the-minute election results for Georgia's runoff. That's online at pbs.org slash newshour. Keep your eye on it tonight. So meantime, we know Republicans are less than a month away from taking over control of the U.S. House of Representatives with a slim majority. Our Lisa Desjardins has that. House Republicans are stepping into power in part because of wins from candidates of color, as well as in some hard-fought swing districts. Those who've won now have a seat at the table over the future of their party. One of them is our guest, Congressman-elect John James from Michigan. He will be the first black Republican elected to Congress from the state. Congressman-elect, first of all, congratulations. Thank you so much. I want to ask you, what do you want to do? And specifically, what, what kind of bills do you think Republicans should pass in the House next year? Frankly, uh, recognizing that uh, the only colors that matter are red, white, and blue for folks in my district and all over the country, uh, addressing bills that lower prices, that make our community safer, and bring back our jobs are, are things that folks in my district and folks all around the country are, are desperate for, making it a more permissive area to, to innovate and create jobs. And I'm just so excited to bring my supply chain and my business background and my military background uh, to help uh, secure our country and also uh, make our economy stronger as well. 
That sounds like deregulation, am I right? The taxes, what are we talking about here? No, great point. So we absolutely need tax reform, regulatory reform, and tort reform. We have to do it in a common sense manner. Uh, we need to make sure that, again, I'm not anti-government, but I am pro-limited government, and there are just certain things that I believe that individuals, families, and local communities do better in the federal government. I actually believe in empowering the people, uh, getting money back to where it's made, putting money back in the hands of people who've earned it, uh, and frankly making it easier for people to, to grow businesses and to keep businesses right in my district, state, and bringing folks uh, back, or jobs back from around the, uh, the country. So yes, um, common sense regulatory reform that of course makes sure that our, our environment is safe and that our, our, our environment is sustainable, um, but also our economy can grow as well. Uh, I think there's a way to walk and chew gum at the same time, and I plan on doing both right here in Washington. While you have those aspirations, you also have a divided House Republican conference. Some members in your conference are still talking about the 2020 election, still <laughs> talking about lies that it was somehow fraudulent, and some say they won't support uh, Mr. McCarthy as a potential House Speaker. You're also on an RNC audit committee to talk about the 2022 election. So my question to you is, how do you make sure that this infighting within your party doesn't get in the way of what you want to do? Look, uh, I have very little tolerance for the political BS and infighting and partisan stuff. Um, the people, the 800,000 folks who sent me here, uh, sent me here to do a job. And uh, in order to be worthy of the post that we have, in order to be worthy of their trust and support, we need to work through our differences, recognize that we need to start and build where we're all of the same voice, where we all agree. Because I actually believe that 90 to 95 percent of the issues that we face, that everyday Americans face, are not partisan issues. Uh, I'm looking forward to bringing my skill set to bear, representing my constituency, my country, uh, to the best of my ability, and really cutting through, working from both sides of the aisle and even in our own conference uh, to make help, uh, help make life better for Americans. I heard you when you said that red, white, and blue are the only colors that matter. But it is notable, is it not, that Republicans had their most diverse slate of candidates ever for nominees this year for Congress. Um, now, on the other hand, not all of them won, as you did, um, including, I think, no black women uh, Republican nominees were able to win their election. I know you've been stumping for Herschel Walker in Georgia. My question to you is, is the Republican Party doing enough to make sure that it's speaking to everyone and recruiting uh, candidates of color? What a great question. I, I've said time and time again, we cannot expect a return where we have not made an investment. Uh, Republicans need to continue to, uh, to address issues in, in colleges and cities all over the country. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. But uh, we're not prioritizing identity. We're prioritizing ability. And I believe that by getting the right messages into every corner of the nation, we're going to begin to win on ideas. And then we're going to be, be able to walk the talk right here in Washington and most importantly back in our district because there are a lot of people, regardless of the color of their skin, who need help and need it now. Now, you are someone who yourself has raised questions about the 2020 election and irregularities, I believe, is the word you used in Michigan. But, you know, all of the really serious concerns in Michigan were thrown out. I want to ask you a straightforward question here. Do you believe that President Biden is duly elected? Yeah, Lisa, I'm going to check you on that. Uh, within three weeks after going through the, the legal process in the state of Michigan, after three weeks, um, once the canvassers, according to the legal process in our state, I congratulated my opponent within three weeks. That is how the law is run in Michigan, and I'm a rule of law kind of guy. So you have to be fair. Moving forward, Joe Biden is our president. I need to check your language here. Joe Biden is our president, but was he duly elected? Of course. Yeah, that's how the process works. I want to ask you about President, former President Trump's statement over the weekend. Um, when he talked about the 2020 election, he said in, on his Truth Social account that essentially there was enough fraud there that, in his words, that it allowed for the termination of rules, regulations, and articles, including the Constitution. What do you think of those words from the former president? Yeah, I was very disappointed by that statement. Uh, I, I swore an oath to the United States Constitution, and I did not quit that oath when I took my uniform off as a combat veteran in the United States of America. Uh, anyone who would destroy the Constitution cannot be trusted to defend it. Now, I've said many, many times before that I can agree with the president without worshiping him, and I can disagree without attacking him. My focus is not on what's going on outside of anywhere uh, outside of my district. My focus is on being here to serve people in my district. And there are plenty of people talking about Trump. Uh, frankly, I think there are a lot of folks who are obsessed with Trump. I'm obsessed with people in my district and doing what it takes to bring jobs back, lower prices, and make our community safer. Does a statement like that disqualify him from being president, a job which is to uphold the Constitution? 
Well, that's a decision for the voters to make in 2024. It's not even 2022 yet. I'm a member elect, I haven't even sworn in. I'm looking forward to getting back to my district and making a to-do list for everything that I need to get to work on to make their lives better. And you guys can talk about the palace intrigue and who's running in 2024. I have a lot of work to do to make life better people in my district. John James, a congressman-elect of the 10th District of Michigan, thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Appreciate it. Today, for the third time in 24 hours, a military base inside Russia was attacked. Moscow blamed Ukraine for what appears to be the deepest strikes inside Russia since the war began. Meantime, the drive for accountability for Russian war crimes in Ukraine continues. In a moment, Nick Schifrin will speak with a leading Ukrainian human rights activist. But first, he joins me here at the desk. So, Nick, hello. What do we know about these targets that were struck inside of Russia, and what about weapons used in those attacks? The target today was an oil field near uh, an airfield uh, in southern Russia. Uh, the Russian governor said multiple drones struck it. You can see it on fire right there. And the location was Kursk. That is about 50 miles from the Ukraine-Russia border. You see it right there. And what's significant there is the pattern and location of the attacks yesterday on a Russian base in Saratov. That is 372 miles from the Ukrainian border. That base hosts nuclear-capable, long-range bombers that have bombed Ukraine. And the Russian base in Ryazan is 350 miles from the Ukraine border. Now, Ukraine is not taking public credit for these, but it is giving hints. Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov earlier today on Ukrainian TV joked that maybe Russian soldiers were smoking near flammable objects. The enemy very often keeps violating safety rules. They smoke in different dangerous places. And very often we hear a word that is sweet to every Ukrainian's ear, cotton, meaning that they had it. And it's a symbol of our victory. The cotton, he said, reminds him of the smoke that appeared above the bases that were attacked inside Russia. So a little bit of a taunt, but neither confirming nor denying. The officials I talked to say that Ukraine did conduct these attacks with drones that they essentially create with technology that they patch together, not with any kind of U.S. weapon. And in fact, the Biden administration has refused Ukraine's uh, requests to send them the longest range, best weapons that they have for fear of escalation, for fear that these kinds of attacks, frankly, could escalate the war. But today, Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken was very clear. He, he said that these attacks inside Russia needed to be seen in context. We have neither encouraged nor enabled uh, the Ukrainians to uh, strike inside of Russia. Uh, but the important thing is to understand what Ukrainians are living through every day with the ongoing Russian aggression against their country. And to give you a sense of how important these strikes are, British intelligence uh, in the UK said today that the most, they are the most strategically significant failures of force protection since the war began. Hmm, interesting. How are the Russians responding to all this? trying to create the, the same terror that they have been trying to create for months. Uh, the Russians launched dozens, nearly 100, according to one Ukrainian official, uh, strikes on civilian homes, uh, on the power and heating infrastructure, as they have been doing. Half of Kyiv had no electricity earlier today. Odessa had to rely fully on generators. And the Kremlin spokesman today even said that there were no prospects for peace, that Russia must achieve its stated goals. Uh, but today in Ukraine, uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky was defiant. He's there visiting a city near the front line, giving Ukrainian soldiers awards. He said the country deserved to gain victory and deserved to gain justice. And one of the organizations uh, helping Ukraine achieve justice is the Kyiv-based Center for Civil Liberties. This Saturday, it will receive the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Norway. Its head is Oleksandra Matvichuk. I spoke with her a few time ago and began by asking her why a human rights lawyer and Nobel Peace Prize recipient was calling for more weapons. I'm a human rights lawyer who have been applying the law to defend people for many years, but now I and other Ukrainian human rights defenders are doing our job in cir circumstances when the law doesn't work and the whole UN system is enabled to stop Russian atrocities. We have no legal instrument even to release one single person from captivity. So the truth is, 
if we want to stop murder and torture in occupied territories, we need weapons to liberate them. When I was in Liberator Kharkiv uh, a few months ago, uh, I saw Russian torture okay. chambers, and Russian soldiers had left behind the devices of dehumanization, uh, the wire that they used to strangle Ukrainians, the electricity uh, that they used to torture Ukrainians. Uh, have these crimes occurred nearly everywhere that Russia has occupied? Yes, and for all these eight years. I have, since 2014, since yes, the initial invasion. when the war started in 2014. I uh, interviewed more than 100 of people who survived captivity, and they told me horrible stories. They told me how they were beaten, how they were raped, how their fingers were cut, how their nails were torn away, their nails were drilled, they were tortured with electricity, compelled to write something with their own blood. One woman tell, told me how her eye were dug out with a spoon. You have been documenting these horrors, as you just described, for many years. Uh, now you uh, have created an initiative that has documented more than 24,000 alleged war crimes. How shocking is that scale? It's enormous amount of crimes, which means the enormous amount of pain. Because we document not just violations of Geneva or Hague conventions, we document human pain. Human pain when Russian troops deliberately shelling residential buildings, schools, churches, hospitals, attack evacuation corridors, manage filtration camp system, organize forcible deportations, commit murder, rape, torture, abductions, and other kinds of offenses against civilians. You uh, and senior Ukrainian officials have consistently talked about creating a special tribunal uh, in order to achieve justice. Why is the International Criminal Court not enough? International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction over crimes as aggression is. Crime of aggression. Yes, we need additional international mechanism to prosecute for such kind of crimes. But we need even more. We need international tribunal which can cover the crimes of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Because now we face with a accountability gap in Ukraine. What do I mean? The national system is overloaded with an extreme amount of crimes. And International Criminal Court will limit its investigation only to several select cases. So the question is, who will provide chance for justice for the hundreds of thousands of victims who will not be lucky to be selected by International Criminal Court? But is the goal in a special tribunal, and specifically the crime of aggression, which the ICC does not have jurisdiction over, is the goal to hold senior officials to account, including Vladimir Putin himself? Yes, Putin and rest political senior leadership, as well as high military command. For the first time, the European Commission has endorsed your call for a special tribunal, but the U.S. has still not endorsed a special tribunal. And, and there are officials I speak to here who are worried that it could take a long time to create a special tribunal from scratch and that it could dilute the work of the ICC. What do you say to those worries? We live in very interconnected, very complex and very quick world. Okay, if before the international tribunals takes too much time, we have these lessons learned why we can do it faster. Meaning you want justice to be achieved during the war itself? Yes, because why we look into the world through the prism of Nuremberg Tribunal when the Nazi war criminals were tried after Nazi regime had collapsed? Justice has to be independent on the magnitude of Putin's regime power. Do you think the West has failed to hold Putin to account in the past, long before even 2014, for example, in Syria, Chechnya, etc.? I'm sure that all this hell which we now faced in Ukraine is a result of total impunity which Russian troops have in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Syria, in Mali, in Libya, in Georgia, in other countries of the world. They like, have never been punished. Russians believe they can do whatever they want. Just last weekend, we heard something from French President Emmanuel Macron. He said that the end of the war would require Russian security guarantees. Are you concerned the international community is more concerned in peace than in justice? International community has to take a truth 
and to understand that there will not be sustainable peace in our region without justice. Because we speak about culture of impunity. We speak about situation when Russia for decades used war as a tool how to achieve geopolitical interest and war crimes as the methods how to win the war. And is it just for your region or do you think that this is a global fight? How important is it for the fight overall uh, against authoritarianism, do you think, that Ukraine finds justice? It's a global fight because this war has a very distinct value dimension. And Putin, he tried to convince not only Ukrainians but the whole world that the rule of law, democracy, freedom are fake values. Because if they are genuine, why they not protect you during the war? And other authoritarian leaders of the, in the world can be inspired by this example. Oleksandr Matvichuk, thank you very much. Thanks. Overdose deaths from fentanyl are on the rise across the country, and it's especially grim for young people. More than 75 percent of adolescent overdose deaths in 2021 involved the opioid. Schools in cities from Baltimore to Tucson are stocking up on Narcan, a medication used to reverse overdoses. Stephanie Sai reports from Sacramento, where Narcan is now available at all K-12 schools. Some really we met this mom in a park in Sacramento. She didn't want to be identified because her 15-year-old son is still battling drug addiction. He was taking counterfeit Percocets. What they do is they crush the pill and put it on foil and light it and inhale the smoke. And so that's how they get the high. She caught it early and intervened. He's one of the lucky ones. There are a number of prominent stories in the area of teens who are doing exactly what my son was doing, except they are not alive anymore. Give them the tools. Pictures of those teens were put up in this high school gymnasium in Sacramento, California. As a handful of parents listened to an information session about fentanyl, a synthetic opioid that is up to 100 times more potent than morphine. Over 16,000 grams um, just in Sac County. Crystal Suchland, a criminalist for the county, has run tests on street drugs that have recently been seized in the area. Everything that we've seen pill-wise, 98, 99 percent of them, are not what they look like. They are fentanyl. That's what we try to tell the kids is if you're getting it off the street, you do not know what you're getting because it is showing up in everything. You think you're getting, you know, a, an oxycodone tablet. It's fentanyl. Organized by a partnership between the group Arrive Alive California and Sacramento County Health and Law Enforcement officials, the presentation was as much about the dangers of fentanyl as it was a pitch for Narcan, a medication that can reverse opioid overdoses. California schools have started talking about putting Narcan in. Romaine Jones, a father of a high school student, was among the concerned parents yeah. listening in. They got the powder and they could put the powder on whatever and you could get your kid, the kids could get, get addicted that way, which I think they also should stress that a lot more mm -hmm. than just the one pill deal, you know, because it's on everything. Jones took a dose of the Narcan nasal spray made available for parents with him as he left. Fatal drug overdoses among teens nearly doubled between 2019 and 2020, from 492 deaths to 954 deaths. Last year, there were 1,146 adolescents who died, the alarming rise largely due to illicit fentanyl. The Drug Enforcement Agency says the influx of rainbow fentanyl, multicolored pills that look like candy, has been a deliberate attempt by drug traffickers to drive addiction in kids and young adults. In September, a 15-year-old girl, Melanie Ramos, was found dead of an overdose in the bathroom of a Southern California high school. Her death set off alarms in schools across the state, and many, like C.K. McClatchy High School in Sacramento, are now putting Narcan on campus. Students we talked to had mixed reactions to making Narcan more available. Eli Ayton is the student body president. If there are kids doing drugs like that, you need some way to help them. Like you can't just let them die on the scene. But I get that it could just be helping the problem because people could get their hands on Narcan to help facilitate their drug use. There is no evidence that making Narcan available in schools would increase opioid use. 
Senior Micah Ria thinks having Narcan around is a good idea, adding that many students may not know what they're really getting when they buy pills. I wouldn't say it's easy to get. I'd say more so it's easy to mistake because, like, let's say a student was like, oh, I want to go get this this weekend, and they don't understand that it could be laced with fentanyl, and then they take it with their friends, and then someone could OD. Okay. I think that's how it would be more popular, more common. Shortness of breath is a big one. We were at CK McClatchy as the school nurse, Caroline Schrader, prepared the campus for Narcan. So this is one of the signs. That exactly. We started putting these up okay. so that we can notify anybody that's in the hallways that we have the Narcan here readily available. We picked the wellness center and the student center because this is where we have a lot of traffic. A lot of kids come through here. They know it. It's a general area to come to. Schrader, a former ICU nurse, says street fentanyl is unpredictable and having Narcan is as important for saving lives as having EpiPens for kids with deadly allergies. A lot of your overdoses don't happen with your addicts. They happen more with your first time users too. They're taking one dose and dying. 27 states, the ones highlighted here in green, have amended laws to make it easier for K through 12 schools to carry Narcan. And school staff who have to administer the antidote are generally protected from liability by existing laws. Having Narcan readily available in American schools reflects the severity of the continuing opioid crisis. And many told us the continuing fallout from the pandemic. The ability to cope went away. The anxiety, the depression spikes. And I do think we're in a mental health crisis because the average person experiences anxiety more than they did three years ago. Student Support Center coordinator Aaron Perry often deals directly with students who have been caught with substances. Perry says since the pandemic he's noticed more kids self-diagnosing and self-medicating. Someone on social media would say hey this is what I have you might have it too. The student would pick up on it and say well I kind of exhibit the same characteristics as you and then they will say well how do I treat this? and then that's when they would start. Have you had any overdoses here? Not as of yet. Uh, there's been some close calls. Teens didn't start using more drugs during the pandemic. In fact, research shows they use them less frequently. The high rate of deaths are evidence of fentanyl's potency. As little as two milligrams can be fatal, and it is being sprinkled into other drugs, including heroin, cocaine, and meth. In fact, the Drug Enforcement Agency says the danger is growing for teens because of social media networks like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and YouTube. Online dealers known as Plugs put up drug-themed social media posts that may contain coded emojis to let someone know they're selling prescription pills or other drugs and to get past community guidelines. The teens can directly message dealers through the in-app chat function. Back at the park, the mom whose son fell into substance addiction says that was how her son obtained pills. This is one of the drug dealers showing his product on social media. She says Narcan is only a Band-Aid and that more needs to be done. It's not the answer. I feel like we're in a crisis point getting to the root of this problem, whether it's cartel pills getting across the border or education for children and parents, more law enforcement. It's going to take a, a village. Her son is currently attending an intensive outpatient treatment program for teens struggling with mental health and substance abuse problems. It's also not something to, that just happens overnight. It's a long journey, <laughs> a long road um, that will, you know, continue. A long road that many parents, teens, and now schools are facing with no clear destination in sight. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Stephanie Sai in Sacramento, California. The largest strike of the year in the U.S. and the largest strike in higher education ever is in its fourth week. This battle is playing out at the University of California, and at its core is a fight over compensation for graduate students, teaching assistants, and postdoctoral workers who do much of the research and teaching on campus. William Brangham looks at the stakes of this showdown. 
Judy, since mid-November, more than 48,000 of these academic workers across 10 campuses in the UC system have left the classroom. They've taken to the streets and the airwaves, advocating for higher wages, improved housing, and more generous leave for parents and caregivers. This group does not include tenured professors. The university system reached a tentative agreement with some workers last week, but the strike continues, as most of the workers are saying they'll stay out for as long as it takes until their demands are met. Tim Kaine is watching all of this closely. He's an associate professor of higher education at the University of Georgia, as well as associate editor of the Review of Higher Education. Uh, Tim Kaine, very nice to have you on the news hour. Uh, could you just lay out the stakes here? Who is it that is striking and what is it that they're demanding? Sure. Um, it's nice to be here. There are four groups of workers at the University of California who are on strike currently. As you mentioned, two of the groups have reached tentative agreements. Um, those are about to, or those are being voted upon right now. Um, the four groups are graduate student researchers, uh, graduate student teaching assistants and graders, um, postdoctoral workers, and academic researchers. Um, so the academic researchers are full-time uh, employees, but not tenure-line faculty members. Um, so a central issue of the strike, of course, is salaries, which the unions argue are woefully low considering inflation and the rise in cost of living in California, uh, and especially the cost of housing near UC campuses. The majority of UC graduate students and postdocs are rent burdened, paying more than half, uh, more than a third of their salary on housing per month. month. Many pay more than half. Beyond salaries, the unions have been negotiating for significant increases in childcare benefits and parental leave uh, for longer appointments to provide stability for benefits for, to support eco-friendly transit and a respectful work environment. Can you give us a sense for people who are not that familiar with higher education and how it's structured and how work is divided, who are these individuals within that ecosystem? I think that's a really uh, good point, an important question. We have these pictures of tenured faculty members doing the teaching and research in higher education, but in the modern era, that's a really small percentage. If we think of instructional workers, it's about 25% are on the tenure track. That means 75% of the people doing the academic work, the research in labs or in libraries or in archives, and the teaching of undergraduate students, about 75% of those are not tenured faculty members. They're graduate students, uh, they're people on short-term contracts, they're postdoctoral researchers. Um, they are among the most precarious of workers in higher education. Uh, many times they're hired on a semesterly or yearly basis. And so one of the things that, for example, the, the postdoctoral workers have negotiated for in the tentative agreement is a two-year appointment uh, at the beginning of their contract rather than a one-year appointment to provide some of the stability so that the work can be improved, um, but also that they can have an understanding of, of what their living conditions will be for a short period. So when, when these workers say to the university, look, we are an enormous and integral part of your educational mission, and we're, we are the workers in this, this big structure of the university system, and we need better pay and better wages and better conditions, what has the university been saying in response? Uh, the university has been saying that the conditions are um, good relative to in other institutions. They've said that they're... Um, current offer had, would put the graduate students, for example, uh, on par with graduate students at some of the, the most elite private institutions, um, and that for a public institution that the conditions are quite good. I think the, the university does recognize the real challenges around housing uh, at UC institutions, um, and they, they argue that the um, housing that they provide is subsidized and 25 or so percent below what the a common uh, what the the larger market would bear. So they argue that yes, the conditions are real, um, but that they are working to do everything they can to meet students and and other academic workers' needs. As we said, this is a a huge strike in California. Do you have a sense that this is going to resonate outside of the state? I think so. I think it's resonating in higher education specifically. Other institutions are looking to California to see what's going to happen. Um, the other workers in higher education are looking to California uh, to see how this is playing out and what their options are moving forward, whether they're unionized or might have an incl inclination to do so. I also think this is part of the larger sort of labor movement and labor unrest that we've seen in the United States in the, the past year plus coming out of uh, the worst of COVID, we've certainly seen um, people 
uh, discontented with their working conditions. We've also seen a, a number of people discontented with the great disparities uh, in salaries and in compensation and in working conditions between those who own and manage uh, businesses and those who do a lot of the work in business. So right now, I think that we are in a, an important labor moment in the, the country's history um, and that this is going to have an impact both in higher education writ large and in the larger economy writ large. All right, Tim Kaine at the University of Georgia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Bill McKibben is an environmentalist and founder of Third Act, an organization that encourages people over 60 to take action on climate change. Tonight, McKibben shares his brief but spectacular take on working together on climate action. I went to Greenland because I wanted to take a young poet from the Marshall Islands, a woman named Kathy Jetnil Kajiner. I wanted her reciting one of her poems up on the ice shelf that when it melted would drown the country that she'd been born on. And while we were hovering around in a helicopter on the way home, a 20 story high chunk of this ice shelf just broke off and fell into the ocean. I was you know, dangling out the side of the helicopter with my stupid cell phone, just trying somehow to capture some sense of, of what this was like. On the one hand, it's dreadful because you know what it means. The sea has just risen another fraction of a millimeter and somebody's life has been made much harder. But it's also a reminder of what an insanely beautiful planet we were born onto. Even as you look on in a certain kind of horror, you also look on in a certain kind of awe. We're used to thinking of change on the planet happening in geologic time, that it takes a very long time for glaciers to move or oceans to shift. Right now, it's happening very much in real time. Everybody's seen those pictures that came back from the first Apollo missions out to space in the 1960s. Those pictures are as out of date as my high school yearbook picture. We've melted half the sea ice in the summer Arctic in my lifetime. In 1970, there were 70% more wild animals wandering around this earth than there are now. It must be said, kids are doing extraordinary work uh, organizing around climate change. But there is something a little undignified about taking the biggest problem that the world's ever gotten into and asking junior high school students to solve it for you. Third Act is a new organization designed to get people over the age of 60 working to defend our climate and to defend our democracy. We started organizing Third Act because we started to understand how much power those of us over the age of 60 possess. A, there's a lot of us, 70 million people over the age of 60. B, we punch way above our numbers politically because we all vote. And C, Fair or not, we ended up with most of the money. Baby boomers and the silent generation have about 70% of America's financial assets. So if you wanted to move Washington or you wanted to move Wall Street, it helps to have some people with hairlines like mine engaged in this work. If you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s, your first act was in that period of rapid social, cultural, political transformation of the 60s and 70s. Our second act was a little more about consumerism than it was about citizenship. That's water under the bridge. Now people emerge in their third act with skills, resources, with time, which they may not have had before, and with kids or grandkids. I mean, your legacy is the planet you leave behind for the people you love the most. And the planet we're going to leave behind and the democracy we're going to leave behind at the moment seem likely to be much shabbier than the ones we were born into. Most older people realize that and that there's a ring in continuing to try the project of building a better society. My name is Bill McKibben and this is my brief but spectacular take on working together. And you can watch more Brief But Spectacular videos online at pbs.org newshour brief.
And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening.